Um, I'm Madeline Aquilina. I'm Kate Cambridge faculty for all four years at North, and I've grown to really love the dark room. So my project was on the origins and motivations of experimental photography. And just to get you guys um, into my terminology, I'm going to give you my working definition for experimental photography. This is how I defined it throughout my paper and my field work. So experimental photography is any form of photography that utilizes techniques of shooting or processing film outside of the digital and silver gelatin modes. So it's anything that's not digital or silver gelatin. This can include using homemade cameras, archaic processes, um, or different, um, and these processes tend to be more laborious and less reliable than digital and silver gelatin processing. So those modes of photography have come into the mainstream for very clear reasons. They're easier, they're cheapest, and they're the most reliable. So that brings us to the question that framed my fieldwork and my paper. Um, how did experimental photography emerge and why do people experiment? So I'm gonna take you through um, a couple of photographers that I found historically and in modern times who use experimental techniques. Oh, um, okay, so my thesis was, um, sorry, this is, so all these artists that I'm going to tell you, um, though they do not explicitly consider themselves peers, they shared common motivations for, exper for experimentation. Um, they sought out different techniques to give voice to their unique ideas, and the techniques they used matched their conceptual goals. And also, they believed that experimentation can push back against a fast-paced digital world and imbue thoughtfulness to the artistic process again. So, this is Harry Callahan. This is called Double Exposed Nude. Harry Callahan was very, very inspired by Ansel Adams. Um, Ansel Adams is probably the most famous landscape um, photographer ever. He did Yosemite. And he was the leader of the straight photography movement. Straight photography was a reaction against the pictorialist movement, which basically was trying to make photographs look like paintings. And basically, Harry Callahan came along and said, why would we do that? We have a camera. We can create sharp, beautiful images. Why would we use this camera to make paintings? And um, Harry Callahan was from the Midwest, and um, he went and saw Ansel Adams speak many times. And he thought, yeah, like, that makes a lot of sense. But this image is not at all like the images um, Ansel Adams made. And um, so he took kind of like an uninfected inspiration from Ansel Adams. He thought, yes, a camera should be used for its inherent capabilities. A camera can do this. He used Ansel Adams' message of using a camera for what it's good for to experiment. And this is a double exposure, which is made by um, exposing your negative twice, so two pictures and one frame. He, the woman is um, his wife, Eleanor. He took many pictures of her. And the um, background is a landscape of a forest in the Midwest. He was from Detroit. And so basically, um, this picture combines two of the most um, like traditional elements of art the female nude and the landscape. So through this, he combined them and created something new. He had a nuance to tradition. And in this sense, his experimentation was a nuance to tradition. It was not a reaction against tradition, as sometimes experimental photography can be. Which brings us to the Dadaist. So Dada was the art movement that emerged in a post-World War I Europe. Basically, um, the social systems were totally, totally gone after the war, and there was new governments in place and hastily made country boundaries. Um, Leah Dickerman, in her book, The Art of Dada, said, Dada was a product of a moral and intellectual crisis. And this crisis also changed the way art was made. So Man Ray was a photographer. He primarily did fashion photography, but he also made photograms, which are photos made without a camera. So that's very different and very kind of a reaction against the mold. Um, it, it doesn't resemble any traditional photographs. Basically what he did, he laid on his hands, the glasses you see there, and a dollar bill, and shone light on it, and then processed it in a traditional um, silver gelatin way. And that is how he created photograms. He described these as pure data, because he took things around him, totally disparate things that were left over from the war. He used lace, rubber, all this like detritus of bombing, and created these photograms. So, he really felt that um, photograms were the pure Dadaism and a really like, representative of experimental photography. Now we're gonna move into some more modern people. Um, this is Dorkira Sesedo. 
He graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago in 1969. He is Japanese. And the way he creates these images, he considers these self-portraits. He put, has a camera. He opens the aperture for about four hours and runs around with a flashlight. And those are the places he was, all those light dots. He calls these um, photorespiration. And um, Max Kozlov said of him in his essay, um, an essay on experimental photography that Tato captures the inner life of objects. So this is another example of a technique long exposure is meant to match the conceptual goals of the artist. This is Mike Ware's cyanotype. A cyanotype was um, a type of potassium-based processing. I actually did a few that uh, was used before silver gelatin came onto the main stream. It is made by leaving objects out in the sun and coating paper with a potassium acid. And he is um, a current photographer. He's a leader in the alternative processing field. He's an Oxford chemist and also a photographer. And I actually um, interviewed him. And he said, I asked him why. Why do you use this process when it's harder and doesn't give you as much, many, much reliable results as silver gelatin or digital would give you? And he told me, using alternative processing increases one range, one's range of expression and imbues a thought, a truth of materials, and an appreciation of the constituents to the work and how they interact. Also, in his essay on the um, polemics of experimental photography, he said, I'm not trying to rewrite the symphony. I'm simply editing the score. So he really views this type of photography as not trying to like overthrow tradition, but he thinks that we shouldn't, um, in making art, we shouldn't default to like what people assume we should use. Instead, we should meditate on all the options we have and pick the best one, even if it's harder and less reliable. So that's what he does with his cyanotypes. So this last photographer that I wrote about um, was Adrienne Little. She's contemporary as well. This is actually an exhibit at a museum in California in 2012. And she uses the Holga camera, which I also use in my field work. It, um, it's a toy camera that you can't change the size of the aperture or the exposure time, so it's very limited. And it's celebrated for all its flaws. So those white spaces are actually um, light leaks. And it, 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 Holga tends to produce a vignetting effect. And people use it because it's a flawed camera. And these flaws create interesting results that are relevant conceptually to their work. So Adrienne Little, this um, was an exhibit called End of the Road. She photographed a town after like some like major crime and murder. And it was about trauma and how and she says in her essay about the um, exhibit that the white spaces are just as important as what is there. So she explicitly says, I use a Holga because it's flawed and because I enjoy and conceptually relate to the flaws that it produces. OK, so now we're going to move to my field work. These are some of the photographs I took. Um, and I can pass them around if you like. Would that be helpful for you? Or can you see them from here? I can't see your OK, I'll pass around the cyanotypes. So with this, just for a brief, um, th I made the cyanotypes by um, basically, I, you can buy kits, but instead I mixed the chemicals and I coated the paper and left it to absorb. So these were, I was really with it the entire process. And then I made transparencies and let them out into the sun for about 10 minute exposures. And this is how they came out. Thank you. So my field work. I basically framed my photo thesis um, with how I saw the world of experimental photography and all the different like shapes it takes on. So my scope. A photo thesis using four different means of experimentation to reach an audience of the community around me interested in art. So that was what I wanted to accomplish, and I think I did. So I'm going to show you some of my pictures. So this was taken with a fisheye camera. A fisheye camera is a camera with a lens that makes you see at 180 degrees. So it basically inverts the um, image. And um, I, all the photographs I took were of my favorite childhood places. Um, this was actually at Washington Park at night, which I lived near when I was a kid. And I used to watch the sunset there with my father. So that was like very meaningful to me as long with all the places. And um, I'm obscured or half in every frame because I'm in a, this year has felt like I'm kind of half year, half not. My sights have been set on moving on. And it's hard to feel 
totally in one place when you're making so many plans to move. So that was kind of conceptually how I went about this. So this is a fisheye. This was with a Holga. So that's what Adrian Little uses. Um, basically, you see the, like, the black around the edge on the bottom. That's the Vignetting effect. This is also at Washington Park during the day. And I wanted to capture um, how I have many memories associated with this place. The, the picture is faded, a bit out of focus. It's supposed to look old. So like the photographers I talked about, I picked certain means of experimenting to match my conceptual goals. So it makes sense. It's not like a random choice. I wanted them to match the ideas I was trying to convey. So this is how you make a cyanotype. Um, this is a photogram like the Dada's did. I did it um, with leaves and different things from my yard. So you leave it out in the sun, and then you run water on it, and that's how they come out. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a photograph, or is that what no, you no, laid no. out on it? That's what I laid out on it. And okay. then, and then the, 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 the like silhouette okay. of them would appear. OK, okay. I also use a large format camera, which was very, very difficult. Um, basically, this is a 4 by 5 so The negatives would be probably about this big. Um, negatives are usually about this big. So you get um, a lot more detail and high resolution, which makes for greater quality pictures. All the pictures here are large format. And basically, um, using this camera, I really like echoed what um, Mike Ware said when I, in his interview. I felt a lot like um, closer to my photographs, because if you have a digital camera, you can click, and you have your picture. But if you're using a large format camera, you have to load the film in the dark, cock the shutter, close the aperture so light isn't leak, take it out, and then click. And so the whole process to take about like 20 minutes to get one photograph. And that, for me, it made me consider composition, um, where I was standing, what I was taking a picture of. And I think that these are probably like the highest quality photographs I've taken in my four years at North, because I was forced to think so hard, and the film was so valuable. And I think that's like a really important um, distinction in using cameras like this and experimenting because it makes it brings the artist a lot closer to the art itself and you were forced to think more and therefore create a better product than with a digital camera it's just like so easy to snap and be done and leave it on your computer for years I'm sure we all have like so many pictures from family trips or just our own pictures on our computer that we'll never look back to but with this you're going to look back to it because it's like your baby and you spent 20 minutes making it. So I'm going to take you through um, a couple of pictures I took and just talk about them. So this was at um, Below's Pond. Um, so I'm in every frame. And the way I did that is I would hide under a cloth and focus it and set up the entire shot. My photo assistant, my father, thanks to him, would um, press the shutter. And so in every picture, I'm in, so this one, I'm in shadow. This is at Below's Pond, and I'm a little bit behind the bush. I'm just trying to show. Um, kind of that I'm not quite here, but I'm still here in this weird period that I felt throughout my senior year. This is another one. You can't see me. I'm sitting on the bridge, but I'm, my legs are right in the corner. Um. <laughs> so this was in my backyard, and this was probably one of my favorite photos I took. I was really playing with scale. In this one, we have huge rhododendron bushes. And so they take up the entire frame. And I'm a little in the corner. And they were really these objects of like magic to me growing up. And we had one that was planted on my birthday when I was born. And now it's that big. And so I think that was kind of an interesting history to the photograph. So thanks. And also, I think um, the biggest thing I've learned from SYP, I think I definitely learned all about these um, different photographers and really informed my knowledge of art. I learned how to make cyanotypes. I learned how to use different cameras. But I am I'm going to college next year, and I'm going to study art. And you know, we, as someone who wants to study art, people are told the whole connotation of the starving artist and all these things to um, deter them from that. The art world declared um, painting dead. No high schools have dark rooms anymore. We're really blessed to have one here. And so it's really kind of hard to like justify that for myself. Why would you study something that's not going to make you any money and is not really viable? And I think 
that this has really, I've like got to interview all these artists, Adrian Little, Mike Ware, um, who really like echo to me that we, there's still all these like possibilities that haven't been explored of different types of processes. I try to make anthotypes when you coat um, paper with like um, fruit juice and it didn't work. And so that's still something I can do and perhaps like figure out a better way of doing it. And so I think that um, this project for me has really reaffirmed and like confirmed me that studying art is something I should do. And that's so valuable for me. So thank you. And any questions? Yeah, put it's some stuff that we did yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same okay. thing. I just, for me, I like, wanted to make choices that would make me like closer to my process and try to avoid anything that was instant because, because my whole like thesis was that this is like an um, anti-technology thing. We're trying to get away from a fast-paced digital way of making art. Anything else? Anybody can be a photographer. Yeah. But it's so easy. Yeah. As in, with digital and Photoshop yeah. and exactly. you know, that there's this kind of blurring between what is quote art, art and oh. what is. Yeah, I think that's been that's something that has like always like kind of like made me feel less good about wanting to be a photographer or wanting to be an artist. Like because now in this place people have like um, apps on their phone to make photos look like this. And for me, that like ruins it. Like, so anyone can make a cyanotype if they have like an Apple iPhone. But I think that um, there's going to be less thought involved if you take a picture on your iPhone than if you spend hours mixing chemicals and coding something. I obviously am very um, like connected to the images I made, and I think that that probably doesn't exist for a lot of people who are iPhone photographers or who are casually making. Art and not really um, like um, like meditating on the uh, initial choices for the art that they make. I think that choice is a really big thing. It's really important to understand that there's more than a digital camera and what like best suits your process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, my friend and I were. She's. I'm going to be in school in Ohio, and she's going to be in school in Portland. And we bought um, like this uh, new um, like Fuji film instant camera, and are planning to take a picture a week and send it to each other. And so I think for me, like along with photo being art, it's also like definitely like I don't think like documentary photo and artistic photo should be different. I think that this for me documents how I felt um, throughout this year. It may not be like the most like. Um, like, I, it doesn't t tell you what I did, but for me, this is like how I felt, and this is the best way to say that. And so I think, yeah, I think it's a very like a effective way of like document, um, like documenting important times for me, but also like um, like trying to um, express my overall feeling of time in the year. And yeah, I think that's something that would definitely be effective for me. Little. Um, yeah, do you want me to go back? Another, no, 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 it's okay. And then one of yours, and, and, and I'm wondering if you're, when you're using the same camera, do you have light leakage in the same place? Can you plan for that, or does it shift? Well, basically, Hoglers are just like bad cameras. Like, they're not well made, they're plastic, they're just bad. They're their toys. And so I think that like the whole point of people who use Holgas is like the like element of the unknown. Okay. And so you can't really plan. And so and um the major um criticism of experimental photography in general 
and especially Holga, is that, wow, like you are just using these like um, like silly kind of um, gimmicks to make your art look different. And I think that's definitely true. You can buy a Holga at like Urban Outfitters. So it's very like commercial in some ways, but I think that there's people who are using them for very like um, real reasons that are well thought out and they are getting their work shown in galleries versus buying it for double the price at Urban Outfitters, which is like a national chain. So I think that there's like two sides to the coin. I think that if you use these processes just to like be different, but not know how you want to be different, but not have a purpose, and it's not going to really produce any like meaningful art. But if you're thinking about the like um, aesthetic choices, then it's a legitimate thing to be doing. Yeah, Ed. Would you consider like um, Photoshop and like new ways of like editing images, multiplying or other mm -hmm. as an alternative technique as well as like silent types? I think it's hard. I think the way I'm defining it, it's like because um, I mean, obviously, like when John Herschel invented cyanotypes in 1840, it wasn't the alternative process. It was a uh, like way, but now anything that's like outside the like realm of the of like of what is of um, convention, I guess, is experimental. But if you were making like digital photography in 1840, yeah, that'd be pretty experimental. But I think it obviously shifts throughout history and through what's in the mainstream. So at this point, no, um, I don't really, just because it's so commonplace. There's actually, uh, this is after my paper was done, but there was this guy who um, used um, grass to make these huge portraits, and he used um, photosynthesis as his project, and, and they end up um, like fading over time. But I thought that was really cool. He hasn't had a work shown in museums, so I didn't include him in my paper, but that's awesome. Anything else? Thank you.